before we jump into today's message, I just want to take a second and apologize for this mess behind me. I'm actually preparing to move back into my college campus in just a couple of days, and so I have everything out and packed up and ready to be put away. With that said, let's go ahead and dive into today's message. I do not have enough time. I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. Who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. And there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes on the ground. Book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 32 through 38. The individuals written of here in this passage were the faithful heroes of their times. They were God's chosen people to bring about judgment, redemption, restoration, and an expansion of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. While writing about these heroes of the faith, the author of Hebrews follows a chronological progression in his list, moving from the time of the judges to the prophets to those who are now persecuted on behalf of their faith in Jesus Christ. This message functions to provide hope and encouragement to an audience who is facing persecution at the hands of their Roman oppressors. Many of us in 21st century America are unable to relate to the types of persecution suffered by early Christians. In fact, we are so far removed from these types of persecution, thankfully, I might add, that it is hard to imagine the temptations that persecution brings. I mean, Christians today who live in peace and safety often forsake their faith, even without threats. But can you imagine how tempting it would be to compromise what you believe in to protect yourself, your spouse, your children, and your closest friends from serious harm? In an effort to overcome this temptation, we must recognize that the persecution and suffering we face works to bring about a harvest of righteousness through which we are able to experience peace, provision, and consolation, as indicated by Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. My name is Christian Rowe, and the point of my message today is that God has much in store for those willing to endure persecution on behalf of their faith. I believe that this message is communicated to us in the way that today's text commends those who have been persecuted, describes the horrible atrocities they were made to face, and expresses a hope for what God's plan has in store. Before we begin to dissect today's text, I think it's important for us to understand both the background and the purpose of the book of Hebrews. Although God is the only one who really knows the author, scholars can conclude two rather obvious characteristics of the author. One is they were a holistic Jew, and two is they were a passionate intellectual. We know that they were a Hellenistic Jew because of their intimate knowledge of Jewish tradition and heritage. In fact, the author quotes the Old Testament over 30 times in just 13 chapters of the book. We can also conclude that the author was an intellectual because of the complex theological arguments that are found in this work, much more complex than many others throughout the New Testament. Though we may not know for sure who wrote the book of Hebrews, we do have a pretty good idea of who the original audience was. This would have been a group of Hellenistic Jews that many scholars commonly refer to as the Hebrews. This group of people identified themselves with the Jewish patriarchs of the Old Testament, but were for some reason still immature in their faith. We know this from what the author, from how the author describes his audience in chapter 5, verse 12. He says, Though by this time you ought to be teachers, 
you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. The last instrumental aspect of the original audience's identity was the fact that they were persecuted on behalf of their faith. As we read through the book of Hebrews, it becomes evident that the original audience had already faced persecution in the past, some of them were suffering in the present, and the author's expectation was that more of them would suffer, perhaps even more severely, in the future. This persecution and suffering is an aspect of the audience's life that the author addresses in today's text, as we read earlier. The faith of those listed in this passage, Hebrews 11, 32-38, of Gideon and Samson and David, of Samuel and the prophets, is one that has been refined by the fires of pain and suffering. The persecution they faced at the hands of their own people functioned to elicit a particular dependence on the strength of God. And though this persecution brought about much pain and suffering for these heroes of the faith, the next two verses assure us that their perseverance is, has been rewarded. Verses 39 through 40 of Hebrews 11 say, These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. This is a little bit of tricky language that the author uses here. It's, it's one of those complex theological arguments that we mentioned earlier. But essentially, they are explaining that those who patiently endure harsh treatment on behalf of their faith will surely inherit a reward from their Father in heaven. This is a truth that is expanded upon by Jesus throughout the Beatitudes in his Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In these few verses, Jesus assures his audience that it is not those whose life is a walk in the park but those who are persecuted that will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Instead of running from anything that has the slightest potential to bring us harm or pain, we should rejoice and be glad that we are counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, just as the apostles did in Acts chapter 5. In Acts 5, there is a little bit of a narrative of several apostles who were made to appear before the Sanhedrin. They were made to appear before this council of elders, of, of Jewish patriarchs, you, you might say, to be punished for preaching the name of Jesus throughout the Jewish temple courts. There was quite a discourse in the story between the apostles, the Sanhedrin, and a righteous Pharisee named Gamaliel, but eventually the apostles were flogged for their, I don't know, for their crime, and in order to refrain from preaching the message of Jesus. But it is then, at this point, that Acts chapter 5, verse 41 says, The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. This is the same attitude that Jesus calls us to have when we encounter persecution and suffering on account of our faith. In fact, this story in the book of Acts, Jesus has promised to his disciples, and this passage that we are examining in Hebrews together today work collaboratively to reinforce the idea that God has much in store for those who are willing to endure suffering, just as our ancestors did before us. As we look forward to what lies ahead of us, it is like we are ants in the sight of God. As such, the blades of grass beneath our feet resemble the tallest redwood trees. A drop from a faucet looks like the falls of Niagara, and a single dirt mound less than a foot off the ground looks to be taller than Mount Everest. And as we consider God's plan for us in the midst of our suffering, it seems as if our perspective is limited, just like the ants. However, when we choose to climb on the shoulders of the giants, of these heroes of the faith who stood long before us, we are able to gain a sense of understanding, to begin to understand why we must suffer so that our devotion to Christ may be seen in the midst of our suffering, and so that others may come to know him through us. 
and so that our faith may be refined through the trials and tribulations of this life, just as theirs was. With the knowledge that God wants to reward us for our suffering, I think it is important for us to practically look for ways to apply this message. For Sardosh, this lesson allows us to have hope when we come across trials and difficulties, because we know that this suffering will be rewarded. Even when our suffering seems to only bring about pain for us and our loved ones, we know that, as James says, we should consider it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds, because the testing our faith produces perseverance. Furthermore, we are assured by the Apostle Paul that the suffering we now face will soon be rewarded. In Romans 8, he writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. In this single verse, Paul reiterates the same idea that we have been dissecting today that comes from the book of Hebrews. God will reward those willing to suffer persecution on behalf of their faith. What's more, this reward would be far greater than whatever challenges we are currently facing. And when I think of this, I can't help but to imagine how true this statement was for Jesus. He suffered more than any who had gone before him, more, certainly more than any of us today. Right? He was abandoned, betrayed, beaten, spat on, humiliated, crucified, and killed. But even still, his suffering is unable to compare with the everlasting glory that has been revealed through his sacrifice on the cross for sins he didn't commit. Through this sacrifice, our sins were atoned for, and we are now able to enter into a life-giving relationship with our Father in Heaven. It is because of Christ's death that we have inherited the Holy Spirit, which gives to us a peace that transcends all understanding and bestows upon us the ability to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit, as mentioned in Galatians 5. Through his noble efforts to carry out his Father's will, Jesus now sits at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. This is the glory that has been revealed through him, and the same attitude we are called to reflect for one another. This calling comes from John's admission that there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends, in chapter 15 of his gospel. And I'm thankful that I serve a God who is ready and willing to demonstrate his own love for me by being persecuted and enduring suffering on my behalf. Though as we remember Christ's suffering, it is also important that we remember his victory. His victory over sin and shame, death and darkness, hell and the grave. Because though he was persecuted, God brought about deliverance from Jesus and his creation time and time again just as he did for the faithful people written of in Hebrews, and just as he does for us today. It is not always easy to cling to the faith that we profess, but the suffering we endure on behalf of our faith is not worth comparing with the power of our God to deliver and provide for us according to his plan. It's like you're on a road trip to the most beautiful destination known to man. The journey is long and difficult, and I mean, it sucks. The AC in the car doesn't work. Your tire blew out once, maybe twice. You've had to stop at least 10 times for gas because your car gets about 6 miles to the gallon. And the road you've been driving on is paved with gravel and littered with potholes. You see, the hiccups in this journey represent the times in our life when we feel like we just aren't good enough. When doing our best just doesn't measure up. When our circumstances tend to drown out the voice of God, and when it seems like we're all alone in the midst of our pain and suffering. Yet we know that once we reach our destination, we will no longer be concerned with such turmoil. No. Instead, we will only be concerned with the praise of our God, with bowing down to Him in worship and with remaining in His presence for the rest of eternity. To echo Paul, our suffering is not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. To apply this idea that what lies ahead is far greater than what we are currently facing means to cling to our faith now ever so tightly. We do this so that when our pain ceases in the night, we will be able to experience the joy that comes in the morning. To cling to your faith over everything else means to turn down your invitation to that party where you know nothing good is going to be going down. To cling to your faith means to extend forgiveness 
to those who have wronged you, even when you feel like they might not deserve it. To cling to your faith means to prioritize your relationship with Jesus over your relationship with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, no matter how cute you think they might be. To cling to your faith means to devote your time to the study of scripture, the discipline of prayer, and cultivating a healthy relationship with your Father in heaven. Because, as we've been discussing, God longs to reward those willing to endure persecution because of their faith. This truth is spoken of by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, reiterated by Paul in his letter to the Romans, echoed in the comfort that James seeks to provide his audience, and expounded upon by this passage in the book of Hebrews that we've been able to take a closer look at today. With this in mind, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our, of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary or lose heart, as the author of Hebrews commands us to in chapter 12. I'd like to challenge you all, as well as myself, to not shy away from suffering, but to instead patiently endure persecution so that Christ's sacrifice would not be in vain. Lean in to when it hurts. Press on and run the race that's been marked out before you. Learn to lean on Him when this life seems to become more than you can handle because we weren't made to go through this life alone. 